Hello, it's Willie from the Ozarks, and we're ready for our August the 14th lesson in the Course in Miracles workbook for students. Reading out of the original edition, Lesson 226, My home awaits me. I will hasten there. My home awaits me. I will hasten there. If I so choose, I can depart this world entirely. If I so choose, I can depart this world entirely. It is not death which makes this possible, but it is change of mind about the purpose of the world. If I believe it has a value as I see it now, so will it still remain for me. But if I see no value in the world as I behold it, Nothing but that I want to keep as mine or search for as a goal, it will depart from me. For I have not sought for illusions to replace the truth. Father, my home awaits my glad return. Your arms are open, and I hear your voice. What need have I to linger in a place of vain desires and of broken dreams when heaven can so easily be mine? <laughs> My home awaits me. I will hasten there. I'm sitting in front of a, uh, a western red cedar tree that I planted as a little seedling years ago. And, uh, and it's actually grown quite quickly. I doubt it's over 10 years old and and it's in front of my house and quite a quite a tall tree it's up about 35 feet now look at that thing way up there and that's something anyway it's up as tall as the house the house is three stories so um, yeah, it's up as high as the telephone poles coming in or electric poles all right, we're looking at, uh, we're ready to start chapter four in our text reading, The Root of All Evil, Introduction. So as you're turning there, let me just tell you a little bit about these Thuja Plicatas. Uh, that's, that's their um, uh, scientific name, is Thuja Plicata. And, uh, you know, they grow in the Pacific Northwest as their and they're making a nice big lumber tree. All, all you people that work with, uh, with lumber, uh, you can get it readily at the lumber yards. It's getting less and less available, I guess, but it's uh, still available. Where redwood's not available at all, which uh, the, the western red cedar, as these are called, this particular variety is the, the green giant. Uh, there are lots of different cultivars, but it's a real fast growing one. Uh, these Western red cedar make great lumber because they uh, they resist rot. They're soft wood. They're fun to work with. Fun to work with. Love the smell when you're working with with Western red cedar. Not to be confused with Eastern red cedar, which is uh, you know the, the the local junipers of the Ozarks. These are not local, but they do good around here. Once you get them started, they they don't really take any care so much. At least I haven't had any do anything on mine. Uh, lots and lots of medicinal uses, and they had all kinds of uses for the uh, uh, the western red cedar, and, and still do. But the native people, uh, they use, or it's been used for um, uh, rheumatism, HPV, and STDs, for lung coughs, suppressant. Uh, Oh, cough suppressant and for lungs, for kidney strength. It's an antifungal, can be used for, against ringworm and other, like jock itch. And just just all kinds of uh, usefulnesses of it, uh, both internally and externally it was used. So uh, study about uh, your Thuja Placatas and uh, get, get one started. <laughs> they grow nice around here. All right, let's take a look at the root of all evil, ready for chapter four, like I said. The introduction. The Bible says that you should go with a brother twice as far as he asks. It certainly does not suggest that you set him back on his journey. 
Devotion to a brother cannot set you back either. It can lead only to mutual progress. The result of genuine devotion is inspiration, a word which, properly understood, is the opposite of fatigue. To be fatigued is to be dispirited, but to be inspired is to be in the spirit. To be egocentric is to be dispirited, but to be self-centered in the right sense is to be inspired or in the soul. The truly inspired are enlightened and cannot abide in darkness. So we want to be truly inspired, don't we? <laughs> enlightened. <laughs> Paragraph 2. You can speak from the soul or from the ego precisely as you choose. If you speak from the soul, you have chosen to be still and know that I am God. If you speak from the soul, you've chosen to be still and know that I am God. These words are inspired because they come from knowledge. Can you say those words? Can you say, I want to be still and know that I am God? If you speak from the soul, you've chosen to be still and know that I am God. These words are inspired because they come from knowledge. If you speak from the ego, you are disclaiming knowledge instead of affirming it and are thus dispiriting yourself. Do not embark on foolish journeys because they are indeed in vain. The ego may desire them, but the soul cannot embark on them because it is forever unwilling to depart from its foundation. 3. The journey to cross, excuse me, the journey to the cross should be the last foolish journey for every mind. Do not dwell upon it, but dismiss it as accomplished. If you can accept it as your own last foolish journey, you are also free to join my resurrection. Human living has indeed been needlessly wasted in a repetition compulsion. Human living has indeed been needlessly wasted in a repetition compulsion. It reenacts the separation, the loss of power, the foolish journey of the ego in an attempt to reparation, and finally, the crucifixion of the body, or death. Four. Repetition compulsion can be endless unless they are given up by an act of will. Do not make the pathetic human error of clinging to the old rugged cross. The only message of the crucifixion was that we can overcome the cross. Unless you do so, you are free to crucify yourself as often as you choose repetition compulsion. <laughs> Unless you do so, you are free to crucify yourself as often as you choose. But this is not the gospel I intended to offer you. We have another journey to undertake, and if you will read these lessons carefully, they will help to prepare you to undertake it. Okay, well that was a little short reading today, and I think we'll stop there. I'm kind of thinking maybe we probably ought to only try to read about one page a day. And he says to read these lessons carefully. And I've been reading two or three pages sometimes when there's a, a section that's, that's long. This introduction was only a page long, and so I think we'll stop there. Tomorrow we'll start with right teaching and right learning. But we'll probably take, a, you know, three or four days to read it, being that it's four pages long. Yeah, we might do a little quicker, but not much. So, because I'd really rather you just get a little bit and think about it and, and then keep most of your focus. Now, I'm not sure I should say most of your focus, but, but really be sure to do your, your lesson for the day and let that be your, your, your primary focus. And then let these, this text reading come to, to, to give you a broader perspective. Uh, that's, that's what it's, it's the theoretical, uh, concepts behind miracle working. 
where the workbook that we're going through is the practical aspects of miracle working. You know, we've got to be practical, actually, where it's useful, you know, where the rubber meets the road, they say, where the soul hits the trail. We've got to be able to, to use it in our day-to-day -day life or, or all that theory is going to just do nothing more than, what's he say, uh, a repetition compulsion. Repetition compulsions can be endless unless they're given up by an act of will. Do not make the pathetic human error of clinging to the old rugged cross. You know, I, I know that all of us, many of us have been, I should say many of us have been raised with the idea that, that we were supposed to uh, die daily. And, and of course, Jesus did tell us that. And in the context he was trying to explain it, he meant exactly what he said. But we've taken it to mean something so differently. And what we want to start learning to do is to find our freedom in the resurrection, in the... Uh, in the, 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 the knowledge that we all are one and that, uh, that, that God leads us through, uh, through each other. That uh, Maybe I should just leave it at that for now. Be sure to, to go back and, and read this. And if you want to read ahead in the text, by all means do so. All right, so tomorrow we'll be ready for uh, right teaching and right learning. Let me mark that so we'll know where we're ready to start. All right, now back to lesson 226. My home awaits me. I will hasten there. My home awaits me. I will hasten there. If I so choose, I can depart this world entirely. Do you choose to depart this world entirely? It is not death which makes this possible, but it but it is change of mind about the purpose of the world. If I believe it has a value as I see it now, so will it still remain for me. Okay, so remember, it's what we value is what we make real. So we're trying to learn to get our values straightened up and in harmony with, with truth, with God. But if I see no value in the world as I behold it, nothing that I want to keep as mine or search for as a goal, it will depart from me. For I have not sought for illusions to replace the truth. Father, my home awaits my glad return. Your arms are open and I hear your voice. What need have I to linger in a place of vain desires and of broken dreams when heaven can so easily be mine? Let's take a look at what is forgiveness. We're to read that every day, and we're supposed to read it slowly and thoughtfully, so you can go back and do that again. Let's read it again now, though. What is forgiveness? Forgiveness recognizes what you thought your brother did to you has not occurred. It does not pardon sins and make them real. It sees there was no sin, and in this view are all your sins forgiven. What is sin except a false idea about God's Son? Forgiveness merely sees its falsity and therefore lets it go. What then is free to take its place is now the will of God. An unforgiving thought is one which makes a judgment that it will not raise to doubt, although it is not true. The mind is closed and will not be released. The thought protects projection, tightening its chains so that distortions are more veiled and more obscure, less easily accessible to doubt, and further kept from reason. What can come between a fixed projection and the aim that it has chosen as its needed goal? It asks that question because it's basically saying, you know, what can come between a fixed projection and the aim that it has chosen as its needed goal, it's implying that once you've got to the place that you, you have this goal of uh, unforgiveness, nothing's going to get in the way because you're going to barrel right along, barrel right along and, and have the same outcomes, that repetition compulsion, <laughs> just keeping on going over and over. An unforgiving thought does many things. 
In frantic action, it pursues its goal, twisting and overturning what it sees as interfering with its chosen path. And you've set a goal up, your chosen path. You know, kind of, and, and, and as long as you do that, you're not going to see a, an alternative. Distortion is unforgiveness purpose. Distortion is its purpose and the means by which it would accomplish it as well. It sets about its furious attempts to smash reality without concern for anything that would appear to pose a contradiction to its point of view. Wow, we, we need to, to learn to say that maybe there's a better way. Maybe there's a new thing I can see, something I can value differently. Maybe we need to more often say the word perhaps. <laughs> perhaps there's another way. Forgiveness, on the other hand, is still and quietly does nothing. It offends no aspect of reality nor seeks to twist it to appearances that it likes. It merely looks and waits and judges not. He who would not forgive must judge, for he must justify his failure to forgive. But he who would forgive himself must learn to welcome truth exactly as it is. Do nothing then, and let forgiveness show you what to do. Through him who is your guide, your savior and defender, strong in hope and certain of your ultimate success, he has forgiven you already, for such is his function given him by God. Now must you share his function and forgive whom he has saved, whose sinlessness he sees, and whom he honors as the Son of God. And one last time on our reading for the day, Lesson 226. My home awaits me. I will hasten there. If I so choose, I can depart this world entirely. It is not death which makes this possible, but it is change of mind about the purpose of the world. If I believe it has a value as I see it now, so will it still remain for me. But if I see no value in the world as I behold it, nothing that I want to keep as mine or search for as a goal, it will depart from me. For I have not sought for illusions to replace the truth. Father, my home awaits my glad return your arms are open, and I hear your voice. What need have I to linger in a place of vain desires and of broken dreams when heaven can so easily be mine? My home awaits me. I will hasten there. And I might add, it's just really what you value. If you value it, then you'll go there. If you value the the transitory goals of the world, then that's what you will find yourself going. Wherever your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So today, let's value our true home. My home awaits me. I will hasten there.